very good evening and uh, uh, let's get going so uh, you have attended a couple of uh, already webinars with me and uh, this is going to be a very basic uh, webinar where i am not going to talk details of uh, any of the any of the modalities but uh, i will just be like trying to highlight how it can be useful how and how much a mbbs student a intern or if at all some post graduates are attending how it can be of utility for each of these uh, 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 candidates or is this uh, uh, category of students so we will get going and this is going to be very basic i will give some examples and in the end you will also be having some quiz like i'll be putting up some scenarios or some pictures which you will have to answer so please attend carefully and uh, try to try to visualize or capture the images which i am trying to show you because now you all people are aware the people who are going for neat that uh, nowadays you get a lot of image based questions right you may be given an image and then you may be asked uh, something relating to that and uh, i think in immunofluorescence images are also a potential uh, kind of uh, a question in future so i think uh, uh, this uh, uh, this webinar will serve the purpose of helping you to answer those questions so let's get going so first i will show you some case scenarios and then we will go to our session it will be a very brief session so please uh, listen attentively so first clinical scenario now i have given here a kidney biopsies right i have shown you some pictures of three kidney biopsies now kidney biopsy is one of the important area where we need immunofluorescence the other most important area is skin vesicular bullous disorders okay so vesicular bullous disorders of skin as well as kidney diseases there these are the two conditions where we commonly use immunofluorescence okay so here is first scenario that is based on kidney and then we will subsequently go on to see some skin cases so here you can see this glomerulus is not normal here you can see little bit of mesangial matrix expansion right you can make out that the mesangium is little expanded though not many cells here you see another scenario where there is some proliferation here you can make out that there is endocapillary proliferation because we are not able to see the capillary loops and we can see some amount of immunoglobulin deposited in the kidney okay so in the glom you can make out lobular accentuation there is endocapillary proliferation now we can say that there is some pathology here again you see that there is like the membrane appears to be diffusely thickened here there is no increase in cellularity now all these are three different cases okay now how do i say that what is this disease the other thing that i would like to go before going to the if that we see the clinical picture we see the serological profile whatever some serological testing has been done then we see the light microscopy and finally we see immunofluorescence and then we form a opinion so here whatever i am just showing you a scenario to set up the session so just try to see that this is a abnormal kidney and if i have this kind of positivity in the mesangium remember i am showing you a picture and this is iga immunoglobulin a okay so this deposit you can make out here correlating here mesangial expansion here you have mesangial deposit so we can say that this kidney biopsy is positive for iga so it is more likely to be a iga nephropathy now i am giving you an example it is not that easy we have to see all the immunoglobulins and all the markers then only we can decide i am just giving you an example coming on to the second one you can see this is a proliferative gn or glomerulonephritis here i have shown you only c1q and remember c1q is very important for diagnosis of lupus and you must remember that c1q deficiency is a cause of lupus nephritis or systemic lupus erythematosus as well as c1q positivity is frequently seen in case of lupus two are different things don't confuse so c1q positivity means you have to think of it is likely to be lupus nephritis 
The other part of it, you have to remember in theory that C1Q deficiency, C1Q is an early complement component. C1Q deficiency also results in systemic lupus erythematosus. Okay. So here I have shown you only C1Q, but in lupus, we will get IgA, IgM, IgG. So all immunoglobulins, we will get C3 complement, we will get C1Q as well as kappa and lambda. So if all these are positive, then we can say that this case belongs to a lupus nephritis. Clear? So here I have just shown you C1Q. Now we will move on to the third one. Here you don't see much of proliferation, only membrane thickening. So if you see this patient is having only proteinuria, membrane thickening. So what will be the pathology? It is likely to be a membranous glomerulopathy. And here you can see that IgG, immunoglobulin G is nicely positive in the membranes. I hope I am clear. So here you see mesangial deposits. Here you see nice bright mesangium as well as membrane deposit of C1Q. Here you see nice membranous deposit of IgG. Uh, so these are certain scenarios how they will help us to make a diagnosis. Now coming on to clinical scenario number two. Here I have included three skin biopsies of different patients. Okay. So just to set up the session here, if you remember now these pictures also, you will have to remember because this can be a, a, a image based question for you. So here, if you see these are, this is a vesiculobulous disorder because the epidermis you can see is detached from the dermis. Now detachment will result in a bulla, but we need to know in histopathology whether the abnormality or detachment is within the epidermis, it is in the supraepidermal region or it is in the junction. Clear. So here, if you see, see, we will not go into detail of it. We will talk about immunofluorescence. So here you can make out that <clears throat> the epidermis has been separated out and one layer of epidermal cells you can see or basal layer you can see that is attached to the dermis. So this is what we called as supra basal splitting or supra basal separation is there. So we will say supra basal vesiculobulous disorder. So broadly, where is the separation? The separation is within the epidermis, okay, within the epidermis and where exactly it is in the supra basal location. So the basal cells are attached here and the epidermis is separated. <coughs> Out. And what do you call this condition or these basal cells? It is called as a row of tombstone. They will appear like tombstone. So this is called as a row of tombstone appearance. Now, row of tombstone appearance and some acantholytic cells, if you find here, is very characteristic of pemphigus. Now, how do we confirm pemphigus? See here. What pattern you will have? You will have a typical fish net pattern. Remember the words fish net pattern. Here you can see that the deposit or immunoglobulin IgG is deposited around each and every cell in a fish net kind of pattern. So fish net pattern in the epidermis with IgG indicates that it is pemphigus disease. And there are separate like pemphigus vulgaris is there, polyasis is there that we will come later. Now, this is another vesiculobulous disorder. See here, we don't have much of inflammatory cells. New inflammatory cells. And if these inflammatory cells are composed of eosinophils with a dermoepidermal splitting, we think of a common disease that is bullous pemphigoid. Remember, pemphigus vulgaris is a suprabasal splitting. That is a intraepidermal splitting. Whereas Bullous pemphigoid is a dermoepidermal splitting. And which inflammatory cell is associated with bullous pemphigoid? It is eosinophils. Now, if the same pattern is there and you have a lot of neutrophils, then we will think it is dermatitis herpetiformis. So you see how the inflammatory cell help us to differentiate. So you have a junctional splitting. Eosinophils are present. It is bullous pemphigoid. If neutrophils are present in the same location, in the same pattern, then it becomes dermatitis herpetiformis. Okay. And how will we differentiate them? We do a 
IF. Okay, now here you see, if you have C3 as well as IgG in the junction, where is the deposit here? Deposit is in the junction or dermo-epidermal junction. Even here, you can make out the split. The epidermis is separated from the dermis. Okay, so here you have dermo-epidermal deposit. Here you have a fishnet pattern. <clears throat> so I hope I am, I am very clear. Here you have a dermo-epidermal deposit and it is mostly C3 and IgG. So if you have this pattern, then we can say that it is bullous pemphigoid. Okay, but suppose you had neutrophils here in the bulla and here instead of G3, G and C3, you had IgA, then it becomes dermatitis herpetiformis. Clear? So if G and C3 is there, bullous pemphigoid, if you have IgA deposit in the same location, then that becomes dermatitis herpetiformis. Now you must be able to analyze how the type in the morphology as well as the immunofluorescence helps us to make a definite diagnosis. Now this is a third case where the epidermis appears normal, but what is the problem here? You are finding that perivascular inflammation and lot of neutrophils. So this is a case of vasculitis, clear? So this is a case of small vessel vasculitis, otherwise called as leukocytoclastic vasculitis. Leukocytoclastic means the neutrophils will break and the nuclear debris will be there. That is why it is called as leukocytoclastic vasculitis. This is a type of small vessel vasculitis. Now, there are many causes of small vessel vasculitis. But one of the common cause, what I have chosen to show you is Henoch scoline purpura, okay, HSP. That is also commonly encountered in pediatric patients. It can result in small vessel vasculitis. Now, how do we confirm that this is henoscholine purpura? If you do a IF and in the vessels, in the, junk, in the dermal vessels, if you find IgA deposit in the blood vessels, then along with the picture, remember IF should not be interpreted alone. You need to have a clinical background. You need to have a histopathological picture like what we are having in vasculitis. And then you have IgA deposit in the blood vessels. Then we can say that it is Henos scoline purpura. Remember, clinically patient will have purpura, patient will have abdominal pain. On biopsy, you will have leukocytoplastic vasculitis. On IF, if you find IgA, then all three are put together. You can say patient is having Henos scoline purpura. Clear? Now I will go very slow. This was the clinical scenario just to show you how IF can help us. So let's see what we are going to learn in this session. First, we will see the indications and applications of DIF. By now, you know what are the applications. Then we will know how to transport the tissue. That is very important. That's a pre-analytical, before analysis, and that is very important as interns, as PGs. You must know how to send the tissue for immunofluorescence. Then we will see a little bit about cryostat, how the cryo processing is done. Then we will see sample preparation, which is a little different from the routine histopathological processing. Then a little bit about immunofluorescence microscope. Then finally, the interpretation of the stain. So I will keep them very simple and very brief. Don't get panic. Okay. So first, why IF is done? By those case scenarios, you must be very clear that to have a definite diagnosis, you need to have IF because you are more than one disease can have the same pattern. So in order to differentiate the same pattern, we need certain specific tests. Like in histopath, we do immunohistochemistry. Similarly, in, in histopath of kidney biopsy, we do immunofluorescence. Only difference is that in, in IHC, that is done on paraffin embedded tissue. What is the form fixative use there? That is formalin. But in immunofluorescence, we cannot use formalin. I will come to that later. But remember, IHC is done on formalin fixed tissue, but IF is done on fresh frozen tissue. So why IF is done? Now I showed you some scenarios where in kidney biopsy, you need to differentiate immune complex disease versus non-immune complex disease. If your IgG is positive, 
that indicates it's an immune complex disease. Whereas if no immunoglobulins, no complement is there in the biopsy, then we say it is a non-immune complex mediated disease. Right, can you give an example of non-immune complex mediated disease which results in proteinuria common in pediatric patients? Try to recall, very common, right? MCD, minimal change disease, F FSGS. So these are the two common disease where we do not have any immune complex deposit. Whereas if you talk about immune complex mediated disease, it can be IgA, it can be lupus, it can be, you have so many, it can be because of viruses like hepatitis, so or many infections. And the commonest one is IRGM or infection related GM. So that is immune complex and non-immune complex. I have given you example. Now immune complex versus complement. Now the deposit in the kidney can be immune complex with complement, like I showed you SLE. Now suppose only C3 is deposited, no immunoglobulins are there, then that will be called as complement mediated disease. If you have read your kidney chapter, then you can know the most common complement mediated disease is C3 GN and it is again categorized into D, D, D. Can you name 3D? Dense deposit disease. Okay. So dense deposit disease is a complement abnormality where complement is deposited in the, in the glomerular basement membrane. Then well, see, these are very few examples I have put. It is not as easy as that. It's, it's a vast thing. So just try to, I have put the very common causes which will be useful in your exam and day-to-day -day life. Okay. And in transplant biopsy uh, to know whether there is antibody mediated rejection, I will show you, we do a stain that is called as C4D, C4D. Okay. So that will help us to know that there is antibody mediated rejection. Also to know recurrence of disease, like suppose a SLE patient is transplanted after transplant whether the disease is coming back or no then we can detect it with the help of immunofluorescence okay so that was about kidney biopsy and the second scenario if you can recall i spoke about subtyping of vesiculobulous disorder as well as vasculitis clear so two indications common you must remember basic it is kidney biopsy and skin biopsy where we have application of immuno fluorescence. Now, how is this tissue transported? If you remember routine histopath, the tissue is put into formalin as early as possible and sent to the histopathology lab. But if you put the tissue into formalin, then that will not be very useful for immunofluorescence because for immunofluorescence, we need fresh tissue, fresh. You cannot put it into formalin. Once it's put into formalin, it's gone. We cannot do a immunofluorescence on that. So if it is an intra-institutional, suppose in the same institute where I'm working, the biopsy is taken in the nephrology department and the transportation time is less than say two hours, three hours, it will reach us, then you can put it in normal saline and transport it. But if you are expecting delay, like say I am doing a biopsy in Pondicherry and I have to send it to some other place in Mumbai or Delhi and it may take say three to four days, then I will use a medium called as Mitchell's medium. Remember, this can be a MCQ. Mitchell's medium is a transport medium that is used for kidney biopsy as well as skin biopsy for the purpose of immuno fluorescence okay so mitchell's media it can preserve the tissue up to five to seven days it is not a fixative it is just for the purpose of storage the other solution that we use is one molar salt solution that is used for salt split this is mostly for the postgraduates you can read and find out i am not going into the detail but for mcqs you can remember mitchell's medium is the preferred transport medium but for practical purposes intra institutional you can send it in normal saline now there we will put it in formalin here we are putting in normal saline and sending and how we will process it we have to freeze the tissue and in order to freeze the tissue what machine is required we need a cryostat cryo means cold and because it's it's a machine where a microtome is there freezing is there i'll show you so it's basically a tissue that is used or it's sorry it's a equipment that is used to freeze the tissue freeze the tissue as soon as possible as well as cut the sections i will show you how the microtome or sorry how the cryostat looks like 
and then we need certain material in histopath we use what material do you know for embedding we use paraffin paraffin remember paraffin is used in histopath but here we will use embedding media that is cryo matrix or optimum cooling media that i will show you what is the temperature range that that will be there for freezing the temperature in a cryostat will range from minus 15 to minus 35 this is a broader category i have put so there may be one or two dif degrees differences in different machines so whatever we use in our place it has minus 15 to minus 35 degree centigrade and how is this cooling done it is done with the help of a cryogenic fluid that is helium now again within the chamber i will show you now this is how a cryostat looks like okay different companies are there what we use is a leica cryostat it's a very costly equipment and you can see that these are the vials normal saline bottles in which the specimens come and here you can see the temperatures okay here right now the time when i have taken the photo the temperature is maintained at minus 23 so here is the blade this is the uh, chuck holder where we will put the tissue and for cutting sections this is the peltier chamber or where the cooling the freezing of the tissue will be done so these are the chucks on which we will put the the cryo matrix or this is what is called as the freezing medium now this is also different brands are available you have to put little bit of the freezing medium on the chuck you have to put the tissue on the chuck and then you have to pull it in this chamber these are called as the chuck chamber here the temperature will be around minus 32 minus 35 <clears throat> and what that will do that will immediately freeze the tissue and why the tissue would be frozen because we know that around 60 to 70 percent of our body composition is fluid so this is how you can see the cryomatrix has been put or freezing media on top of it you can put the tissue and freeze it then what you can do then the then the chuck is connected to the holder and here with the help of a rotary microtome which i have already shown there in the cryostat it is available you can take multiple sections okay and those sections has to be stained with a rapid stain in a routine histology we use hematoxylin neosin here also we use hematoxylin neosin but it is a rapid stain which we use to assess whether the tissue is adequate or not once the tissue is adequate we will go ahead and do the immunofluorescence staining so what is the utility of frozen section now frozen section you must remember that uh, now cryostat is for certain purpose cryostat is not just for immunofluorescence cryostat has other uses again this can be a mcq purpose for you so you you have to remember little bit of it now the advantage of a frozen section is it is a rapid easy minimum chemicals remember we are just putting it and we are freezing it and special stains can be done so these are certain advantages of frozen sections and what is the applications first intraoperative remember intraoperative while the surgery is going on suppose the surgeon has to operate a squamous cell carcinoma he has taken a three centimeter clearance now he wants to know whether the tumor margin or the surgical margin is clear of tumor or no so in that case what we do see intraoperatively uh, time is very limited we have to give an urgent report within half an hour the turnaround time is around 25 minutes maximum you can take is 25 to 30 minutes so routine processing will not have what we can do we can freeze the tissue cut the sections from the necessary area and we can tell the surgeon whether the surgical margins are involved or not involved so intraoperatively surgical margins sometimes they want to know the type of tumor that is not always possible but sometimes like they want to know whether it is a epithelial tumor or it is a germ cell tumor they want to know whether it is a benign tumor or it is a malignant tumor which will help them in the planning the further surgery and remember all this is happening while the patient is still in the operation table right so we can't delay too much we have to give a faster report sometimes like if they will take out a parathyroid they are not sure whether they have taken out a parathyroid tissue or they have taken a lymph node so when we do a frozen we can tell them yes the parathyroid tissue has been taken out so they will be sure that okay in a parathyroid adenoma surgery they have correctly taken out the parathyroid
there are something called as myopathies. Now, myopathy means pathology of muscle, which can be of various types. And how do we identify the specific type of myopathy with the help of enzyme histochemistry? Now, certain enzymes have to be tested on the tissue that whether that enzyme is positive or negative, if it is positive, at what pH, at what is the pattern of distribution. So that will help us to identify. If we put this muscle into routine processing, routine processing has a lot of chemicals. So these enzymes will be uh, degraded and then we will not get a proper enzyme stain. That is why for immunofluorescence as well as immunohistochemistry, we need fresh frozen tissue. I hope I am clear. Muscle you need for enzyme histochemistry and skin and kidney biopsies for immunofluorescence testing. You can also do some special stains. Red O is done for lipids. Okay, oil red O is done for lipids. Now, if you have to do this stain, you have to do it in a fresh tissue. Otherwise, what will happen if you are doing in routine processing, there is a lot of alcohol used in routine processing, which will wash off the stains, which will wash off all the fat. So you will not be able to demonstrate fat. That is why for the demonstration of fat, we need frozen section or fresh tissue and the stain performed is oil red. Oh, I hope I'm clear this can again be MCQ. So intraoperative help, immunofluorescence, enzyme chemistry and special stains. These are some of the utility of cryostat. So immunofluorescence is one of the utility of cryostat. Now, what is the contraindication? Fat and bony tissue. Bony tissue cannot be cut because it is very hard. Remember, bony tissue in routine processing are decalcified. They will put into acid. The calcium will be washed off. It will become soft. Then we can take a section. So that is called as decalcification. And fat will not have much of lipid water, so we cannot freeze it. Okay, fat will be like lot lot of lipid or you can say cholesterol and other fatty substances that not have water. So when you try to freeze it, you will not be able to freeze it. So fatty tissue and bony tissue, these are a contraindication for frozen section or cryostat section. Again, this can be a MCQ. That is why I have put it in red. Now, how the sample preparation is done? You need not know the detail of this, but you must know that we do not use formalin in case of IF, we will put it in, we will freeze it, fresh tissue. We need fresh tissue, not in formalin. It can be in normal saline or Mitchell's media. Remember, I am repeating and stressing on them so that it gets fixed. So we will wash it. This is not required much. So what we, we will put it in isopentane and that will be immediately snap frozen in liquid nitrogen. In and kidney biopsies, the tissue is frozen inside the cryostat. Here, the freezing is done with the help of isopentane as well as liquid nitrogen. I am not going into the detail of it. Remember, isopentane and liquid nitrogen are used for snap freezing muscle biopsy. Okay, Not for kidney and skin. Remember, it is used for muscle. We cut adequate sections. We treat it in different uh, reagent. We put the antibodies. We incubate it in the dark because we are putting certain fluorescent substance. If they will expose to light, the slowly the fluorescence will go away. So it has to be incubated in the dark. Then we will wash and then we will mount and we will observe it under the microscope. And what microscope we use? Not the routine microscope. We will use a immunofluorescent microscope, epifluorescence microscope. Clear? Immunofluorescence microscope. And here the mounting media is glycerol on PBS. What is the mounting media in normal processing? It is called as DPX, DPX, okay. Here it is little different from that mounting media. Which antibodies do we use? This is again an important thing. Please listen carefully. When we talk of kidney biopsy, we use three heavy chains, G, A, M. We use two light chains that is kappa and lambda. We use complement components C3, C1Q, C4D. C4D is used for antibody mediated rejection. And C1Q is very helpful in diagnosis of lupus nephritis. Okay. Then others like PLA2R, another antibody that is used to differentiate primary versus secondary membranous glomerulopathy. PLA2R, primary versus 
secondary membranous glomer look at the i am stressing again i will be asking you questions so that it gets fixed in your memory when we come across skin biopsy we do not use all the all the markers that we use in skin biopsy commonly we use g a m m is also not that important m we use when lupus is suspected otherwise mostly g and i g a these two immunoglobulins will help us in most of the skin disorders and complement component that we use is c3 so c3 iga and igm these three markers are useful in skin biopsy whereas we use multiple markers in case of your kidney biopsies please remember that then what are the fluorophores that are used now we need to have a fluorescent substance so that we can see once the light falls on it there is a uh, absorption spectra then there is a emission spectra and then we are able to see it under the microscope right so what are the different fluorophores that we use so you can remember at least one and this can be your uh, mcq type the most common is fluorescein isothiocyanate in short it is called as fitc fitc or fluorescein isothiocyanate okay sometimes you may get the the mcq like the emission excitation as well as emission remember here that we use a light source which will emit the light at certain wavelength okay that is called as excitation wavelength that will come and fall on the fluorophore once it falls on the fluorophore it will emit another light which will be of a different wavelength here you can see the emission spectra is in 519 nanometer here it is 495 so the excitation spectra is different from emission spectra and what we capture is the emission spectra and we see it as a different color if i use fitc we will see a green color i showed you so many images of immunofluorescence where we were green seeing green color that was because of fitc this is the most common fluorophore the other fluorophores that can be used is texas red now if you use texas red that will give you a red color instead of green you will get a red color you can use alexa fluor and this will have a, a, a excitation and emission spectrum which is close to fitc so this also falls in the green spectrum so here also you will get a green color light like i have shown you different images but you can just remember fitc is the most common now what is the principle of immunofluorescence okay so here basically there is a antigen antibody reaction now the antigen is already present in the in the biopsy or in the kidney tissue in the skin tissue what we are doing we are sending the antibody which will go and bind to it and what we do the antibody which we are sending is tagged with a fluorophore like i said fitc so when this fitc labeled antibody will go and bind to that tissue then it will give a immunofluorescence so there are two types of immunofluorescence for your information one is a direct type of immunofluorescence which we are using for skin as well as for kidney biopsies remember for skin and kidney biopsies we are using direct immunofluorescence where a single antibody that is tagged to fluorophore is used and this will go and bind to the target clear then there is a second type which is called as indirect immunofluorescence this is a little more cumbersome and complicated step where we use two antibodies okay here we use two antibodies so the first antibody will go and bind against the patient skin and the second antibody will go and bind to the first antibody so here what happens we are doing mostly this for serological testing for ana and dstn now suppose what we will take here is a cell line or suppose we will take a cell culture cell and on top of it we will put the patient serum so what will happen if the patient is a sle patient then the patient will have ana and dstn these antibodies will go this is the primary antibody this is coming from the patient so what will happen this primary antibody will go and bind to the tissue now the tissue is a artificial one what we have taken culture tissue okay culture cells to that we will add a conjugated antibody or a tagged antibody and that it will be tagged with a fluorophore so the second antibody will go and bind against the primary antibody which is coming from the patient okay so this is mostly used for serological testing whereas direct immunofluorescence is used for kidney and skin biopsies 
how it is interpreted i have already told you you have to see it under the immunofluorescent microscope now this is the epifluorescence microscope this is little different from our conventional compound microscopes what we use in our day to day life because there the light source comes from below but here the light source comes from above i have already explained the light source nowadays there are multiple light source but the preferred light source nowadays is led lights okay so here they will emit certain certain wavelength of light that will come to this dichroic mirror that is called as the excitation light okay excitation emission so you will have a excitation filter which will absorb certain wavelength and will allow certain wavelength to pass the required wavelength will pass that will come and fall on the sample or substrate then what will happen it will get activated and another wavelength of light will be emitted from the substance now this will again come to the dichroic mirror this dichroic mirror will allow this light to pass now once it allows to pass there will be another filter called as emission filter here we have the excitation filter here you have the emission filter and this emission filter will filter out the necessary things and it will send us only the necessary lights and that we can see in the objective or eyepiece so this is how your uh, immunofluorescence or epifluorescence microscope works now we have seen how to do the staining which microscope to use now comes the most important part how to interpret now interpretation should be done as soon as possible because if you keep then what will happen this epifluorescence or immunofluorescence the, the brightness will go on fading as the duration goes on increasing so it should be interpreted as soon as possible and you have to document it and how will you document you have to capture images and these images are useful how they are useful to document to prove to more if required as well as for teaching i showed you so many images how did i show you because i have captured them in a pattern that is as per the comfort one can follow any pattern but same pattern should be followed for all reporting look at all the compartments now you have to look at the glomerulus you have to look at the interstitium you have to look at the blood vessels so you have to look at the tubules you have to look at all the compartments similarly in the skin biopsies you have to look at the epidermis at the dermo epidermal junction as well as in the dermal blood vessels so you have to carefully observe all the portions then relative intensities of each antibody now like i told you igg iga igm so many stains are there so which stain is like dark or more bright which stain is 2 plus which stain is 3 plus so all those also we have to take into account now you don't go into the complications of that just remember relative intensities of each stain has to be noted now i'll show you some images how the intensity is v grade it is not that useful but sometimes you may get a image based question like you see here we do a, 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 a intensity scoring from 1 to 3 okay 1 plus is minimum 3 plus is maximum and 0 is absent so i have already told which conditions are absent in mcd fsgs we do not get any immuno stain now if you see here very faint staining of igg is there okay so this i will put as plus 1 or 1 plus staining if you see here this is little brighter so this i will put as 2 plus pattern of staining and here if you ask me this is very bright you can see the comparison this is 1 plus this is 2 plus and this is 3 plus that is how we grade the intensity of stain so that was about intensity now what is the distribution that is another important thing to know so distribution can be glomerular can be tubule can be interstitium but i will just show you some glomerular example now in the glomerulus you can have them in the glomerular basement membrane for example all immune complex mediated disease will have some deposit in the glomerular basement membrane here you can see nice staining of in the membrane it is a granular staining it is a three plus staining it is in the membrane and if the patient has a nephrotic rage proteinuria and morphologically there is membrane thickening i can say this is membranous glomerulopathy now the second pattern you have to see is whether the deposit is in the mesangium okay so here you can make out here the difference you can make out here it is mostly in the membrane here the deposits are mostly in the mesangium here it was igg here it is iga 
So all the intensities, all the antibodies, which is positive, which is negative, all matter in interpretation. Then comes the third, that is GBM as well as mesangium, which is common in SLE. So here you can see it is very bright, three plus in the mesangium as well as in the membrane. This is another example where it is three plus in the mesangium as well as membrane. And you can make out that this is granular, dot, 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 that types. Okay, it is a granular staining. Now that was about the place where you will see. Now the pattern again you have to see whether it is granular or it is fine. So if you see here, you can make out dot, 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 that kind of pattern. This is again IgG. So this we will say is three plus granular staining. And where is the staining? It is mostly in the membrane. Then there is linear staining, okay? And that is common in NT-GBM. So if you see the same IgG in a linear pattern, this is in a linear pattern in the membrane, then we will call it as NT-GBM. Remember, for you people, only one condition will have linear positivity, that is NT-GBM disease. All other immune complex will have granular deposit. For you, important, you need to have a linear pattern in case of NTGBM that can be a MCQ. You can get a smudgy kind of positivity in amyloidosis, not that important for you. Here you can make out these are very bright and here it is not so bright kind of smudgy positivity. Now comes the light chain that we discussed about the immunoglobulins. Now comes the light chain, kappa versus lambda. And this is very important. Why you know? Why kappa lambda restriction we need to know? Because monoclonal. If kappa restriction or lambda restriction, then we know that it is a monoclonal or neoplastic condition. Now, can you tell me this kappa and lambda, whether they are like uh, lambda is more than kappa or kappa is more than lambda? If you see both, they look almost equal positivity, right? And they are in the membrane, they are granular staining, they are 2 to 3 plus staining. Now, in this, can you tell me whether it is lambda restricted or kappa restricted? It is very easy. I hope you people are picking up. You see, this is very bright, right? This is like a three plus positivity, whereas here there is no positivity. So we can say that this is lambda restricted. And once we report lambda restricted, the patient has to be investigated for monoclonal disorders or plasma cell dyscrasias. Okay, you, you read detail about it. Plasma cell dyscrasias will result in kappa or lambda, one of the light chains being excess. Now, DIF patterns in kidney biopsies, this is a table I have just put. You can freeze this, this, this slide and you can remember it, some of them, which will be important for your MCQ purpose. Linear IgG, what is the disease? NT-GBM disease. Starry sky pattern, it is infection-related GN or post-streptococcal GN. Nowadays, we don't use the term PSGN. We frequently use IRGN or infection-related GN. Messenger staining of IgA, which disease? IgA nephropathy. C1Q positivity is very common in lupus nephritis. See, many diseases can have C1Q, but for you as basics, you must remember if C1Q is positive, it is likely to be lupus. Now, if you have only C3, no immunoglobulins, then you have to think of C3 glomerulonephritis. Very clear, in C3 glomerulonephritis, no immunoglobulins, no kappa lambda, only C3. Clear? Then comes PLA2R. I have already told that it comes positive in membranous and it helps to differentiate primary versus secondary. So this PLA2R will be positive mostly in case of primary and very rarely it can come positive even in secondary. Kappa lambda restrictions is very important because if kappa or lambda is restricted, we can think of amyloidosis, cast nephropathy. I will further show you some. In transplant, we do a C4D and where we will see for this positivity, we will look for in the peritubular capillaries, PTC, peritubular capillaries. And this is indicative of antibody mediated rejection. So MCQ, now, in skin biopsies, I showed you certain cases. So, if you have a fishnet pattern, which other disease you can think of? You can think of pemphigus. If it is fishnet, 
IgG, you have to think of pemphigus. But again, there is a little bit of difference between pemphigus vulgaris and polaceus. This is for the postgraduates and people who want to know a little bit more. Now, there is certain things called as desmoglein, okay, DSG1 and DSG3. These, this pemphigus is an autoimmune disease where you have autoantibodies against desmoglein. And this desmoglein 1 and 3 are variably distributed throughout the epidermis. So if you have this desmoglein 3, which is distributed throughout the epidermis, and you will have a fishnet throughout the epidermis, then it is called as pemphigus vulgaris. Whereas if you have a fishnet pattern in the upper part of epidermis, then it is called as pemphigus polyaceus, where you have antibody against desmoglein 1, DSG1. In pemphigus vulgaris, it is DSG1 and DSG3, whereas in pemphigus polyaceus, it is DSG1. That is why in, in pemphigus polyaceus, you will have a splitting in the upper subcorneal, subcorneal, just below the corneal layer, you will have a splitting, whereas in pemphigus vulgaris, you will have a splitting. Then comes dermoepidermal junction positivity. Now, this can be seen in many conditions. And you have to do certain other extra investigations as well as clinical correlation to find out which is the specific disease. But if you have C3 and G positive in the dermoepidermal junction, you can think of bullous pemphigoid as well as epidermolysis bullosa acquisita, okay, EBA. One more thing is NTP200. This is a new antibody available. This can also be tried on IF. If this is positive, then you can say the patient is having bullous pemphigoid. And this can be important MCQ. NTP200 antibody is positive in bullous pemphigoid. I hope I am clear. Then if you have IgA, if you have IgA in the junction, then you have dermatitis herpetiformis. See how the diagnosis is changing. Same junction, if it is GNC3, bullous pemphigoid, IgA, dermatitis herpetiformis, as well as linear IgA dermatosis. This is not very important. These three that I have put first, you have to remember IgG and C3, bullous pemphigoid, IgA, dermatitis herpetiformis. And remember, which inflammatory cell will come in DH? It is neutrophils or eosinophils. I have told in the first, second slide. Okay, it is neutrophils. In bullous pemphigoid, you will have rich in eosinophils. And then if you have a dermoepidermal junction positivity for G, A, IgM, C3, that is more indicative of SLE. So this is again in SLE. Then comes blood vessels. Now, if you, I have already shown you a clinical scenario where you have IgA deposit in the blood vessels that will indicate henoscholine purpura. In short, it is called as HSP. Okay, this is a vasculitis, small vessel vasculitis commonly seen in pediatric patients, people less than 18 years of age. Same blood vessels, if you have an IgG deposit, then we can think of SLE or immune complex mediated vasculitis. So morphologically see, vasculitis is there. Small vessel vasculitis is there. But if it is positive for IgA, I will think of henoscholine purpura. If it is positive for IgG, I will think of SLE. Can you make out now how the diagnosis is changing based on the pattern of positivity? So these two uh, slides, the, the IF pattern in kidney and the IF pattern in skin biopsies, I have put the most important ones, the most important ones which will come as MCQ. You can just remember few of them. But you remember, just don't mark them up. Try to understand them conceptually how I have explained. So it will be easy for you to answer the MCQs. Now we have completed our session. So it is quiz time. I'll just show you some images and you try to recall whatever I have told you. So what is the pattern of staining here? Can you tell me whether it is 3 plus or 2 plus? Here the staining intensity is? Yes, it is a 3 plus intensity. Where is the pattern or where is the distribution? It is mostly in the membrane. So which is the disease I'm talking about linear positivity? It is NT, especially for the NET and trans, you can get some image based questions. Nowadays that is becoming a trend. So this will help you in identify. This is mesangium, this is membrane. You can clearly see the difference. PLA2R, what is the utility of PLA2R? Come on, recall, PLA2R is used in membranous to differentiate primary membranous versus secondary. Now, why do we differentiate primary versus secondary? Because primary disease will have a different treatment. 
secondary membranes will have a different treatment. C1Q positivity is frequently seen in which disease condition, which autoimmune, common in young females? It is lupus nephritis. Okay. C1Q we do in kidney biopsies. C1Q we don't do in skin biopsies. That is not necessary. That uh, The morphology as well as the other markers are good enough. This is C4D. C4D is done in which condition? C4D is done for ABMR or antibody mediated rejection in kidney biopsies. Where will you see it? You will see it in the peritubular capillaries. Here you can make out they are positive in the peritubular capillaries. Now this is about kappa and lambda. So can you tell me where is the whether, whether kappa is restricted or lambda? Lambda is positive or negative? Lambda is negative. What about kappa? Kappa is positive or negative? It is 3 plus positive. And where it is positive? It is positive in the cast. In the cast. So we can say this biopsy with the more now, this is another point important for MCQ. In amyloidosis, we find lambda is more than kappa. Most cases will have lambda restriction, few kappa restricted, whereas in caste nephropathy, it is reverse. You must remember this is important. Okay. In caste nephropathy, kappa restriction is more than lambda. And it is throughout the epidermis or basal layer, it is throughout the epidermis. So this is likely to be pemphigus. But what have I shown here? I have shown here. IgA. I have not shown you IgG. Remember, I have told you, you have to see which antibody also. So, this is not pemphigus vulgaris. This is IgA pemphigus. Okay. In pemphigus vulgaris, you will get IgG. In IgA pemphigus, you will get IgA, but the pattern remains the same. So, see the difference. How antibody positivity, like each antibody positivity will differ the diagnosis. Okay. So, here you see Again, you have deposit in the dermoepidermal junction. I have already shown you the picture. This is IgG. So C3 and IgG comes in bullous pentagoid. And this also image I have told you. I had shown you an image of IgA. Okay, if you have IgA vasculitis, which is the condition IgA deposits you will find? You will find in HSP. What about uh, IgG? If you find IgG in the vessels, you have to think of other immune complex mediated vasculitis. I hope I have made my message very clear. So we will summarize now. First, there can be overlapping morphology in many diseases. Remember, the morphology kidney biopsy will look the same. If I take a vesicular bullous disorder of skin, dermoepidermal junction splitting is there. I don't know whether it is bullous pemphigoid or it is a EBA, so or it is dermatitis herpetiformis. Morphology will give some clue. But for confirmation, you need immunofluorescence. Like in tumors, we used immunohistochemistry. DIF is mandatory or direct immunofluorescence is mandatory for all kidney biopsy interpretation. DIF is very useful in vesiculobulous disorders. Remember, without DIF also, we can report skin vesiculobulous. But in difficult cases, this IF will help us to decide whether it is vesiculobulous like because of uh, bullous pemphigoid or it is because of epidermolysis bullosa because the treatment is different. Remember, the disease you diagnose, the treatment will vary. So just identify the importance of a pathologist. Okay. So the pathologist diagnoses the diseases and the clinician can only suspect and the pathologist can confirm. Okay. The third is the type, the intensity, the pattern, the location, everything matters. So you have to be careful when you are choosing MCQ, whether it is IgA positive, IgG positive, it is in the dermoepidermal junction or it is a fishnet pattern. So everything matters. Now cryostat has many uses I have highlighted. Intraoperative is very important, but we use also in immunofluorescence as well as enzyme immunochemistry, as well as we use it for special stains like serological, your, your light microscopy, then your immunofluorescence or immunohistochemistry. It is not one modality that will help you confirm, but the final diagnosis comes with the correlation of all these modalities. Thank you so much. I would like to express my gratitude to my institute, JIPMAR. This is where I work, my department faculties and staff, and of course, my residents who are always a boon to us, who help us, and we, we tease them, and, and obviously, we also learn from them. Okay, thank you so much.